Greetings everyone. On the bench today we're going to take a look at the LM1875 and TDA2050 amplifiers. Kind of a continuation of a video I did a few years ago. These are my favorite classic chip amps. Why do I like them so much? They make nice little amplifiers in the 10 to 25 watt range. Pretty inexpensive for do-it-yourself. They don't require a massive power supply, massive heat sinks. And they don't require a lot of components. You can see here it's quite small. So a couple years ago I did a video comparing these chips and see which one was better. Well I found depending on what I was looking at, one chip performed better in one area and the other chip performed in another area. But what I found pretty interesting was the TDA2050 had lower distortion. Although the LM1875 is still pretty good. So now that I have the Quantasylum audio analyzer, I want to take a look a little more in depth at the distortion measurements at different loads, different power supply voltages to see how the chips perform. And then at the end of the video, I'll kind of uh, refresh some of the other findings from the other video, though I'll put a link if you want to see that other video where I went through all the tests with these amp chips. So I'm going to be using these boards I found a while ago very nicely laid out the ground paths and everything they should perform pretty well on these boards I am using known authentic chips when these boards first came out they were using recovered authentic LM 1875 chips as my coil rolls away there and um, I haven't bought any since because I had several of them but since then, I think they've run out of those chips and are using counterfeits on these boards. So when you buy these boards, I would purchase an authentic chip. Now, the TDA2050 was discontinued back in September of 2013. So any chips you see available today are probably fakes or counterfeits. Although there are some new old stock out there. The LM1875, of course, is still available, much easier to find. But, of course, on those certain websites, they have counterfeit versions of those as well. Okay, so what I'll do is, since I have the TDA2050 board set up on the heatsink, I'll run the test first, and then I'll have to uh, put this on the board and run its test next. Frequency response measurements are almost pointless with any decent linear amplifier because it's it's always going to be flat. I mean, audio files might want it even flatter. You know, if it's within a dB, it's fine. So here's this chart. 0 dB minus 1 dB. At 20 hertz, we're one-fifth of a dB down. At 10 hertz, we're what three-fifths of a db down we're not even a db down yet and on the other end of the scale 10k 20 30 40k we're a fifth of a db down i mean that's excellent the reason it falls off is the way i have the quant asylum set up I, it's just not met, putting a signal out at that point so it doesn't really see anything and it just falls so yeah I mean, this is audio file flat. Well, folks, I was not expecting this. This is just totally unreal to me. This is the TDA2050, 8 ohm load, running it at 1 watt, which would be considered a normal listening level. And um, look at this distortion, 0 0.001. You know, it's about 0 0.002 incredibly low I mean this is just a, a cheapo chip amp, amp amplifier <laughs> unbelievable okay this is the maximum power before clipping into 8 ohms I'm running at plus and minus 12 volts I will run it at higher supply voltages which shouldn't really affect the measurement much it might even be better or it might drop a little worse due to current depending on linearity of the output stage, but it's still excellent. You know, right before clipping levels, it's still 0.00362%. Just 
excellent. <laughs> I'm just actually surprised, really. I wasn't expecting this low of numbers. Okay, looking at 4 ohm loads now. I wasn't lazy. This time I actually set the readout to say 4 ohms. So at a 1 watt level, it's still a very excellent, around 0.004%. So let's uh, crank it up and see what it does. Okay, running just under 8 watts now, and uh, still excellent. It's a little higher than before, especially when we're looking at the 8 ohm loads, but you know, if I crank it higher, let's push it towards clipping and see what happens as we get higher. So we went over 0 0.01 now as we're approaching clipping. Probably should move the camera so you can see the spectrum there. Try to keep it all in the camera here. Shaky cam mode here. Yeah, we're almost into clipping. It's starting to jump up as I crank it up. Yep, yeah, we hit clipping. See, it's jumping at to over 1% distortion. As the samples come into the analyzer, we're at 1.4%. One little bump up and it'll jump way high. See, that's how you can tell you're getting into clipping as you, you know, crank up the amplitude button here. As it steps up, you can see it's getting into clipping. Now remember, we're only running at plus minus 12 volts, so we don't have a lot of uh, headroom for power. So, like I say, I will do the graphs and run at higher voltages and uh, supply voltages and see what it does. This thing is the Measure Baiter's Delight. Man, why didn't I buy this a long time ago? Anyway, after picking my jaw up off the floor, I'm going to turn off the camera and get some graphs and things. We'll see how it performs at different power levels and across the frequency band. You know, it may not be as good as it looks here just at one kilohertz. Of course, one kilohertz is a very important frequency because all the harmonics are going to be right where your hearing is the strongest. But yeah, this the cheap little $3 chip amp is doing that well. Okay, I have some results for you. First we'll look at the total harmonic distortion versus power. So let's zoom in. This is the TDA 2050. Now, uh, you can label these with your own text. i just kind of lazy and don't do that. I use blue for the 8 ohm load and 4 ohm is red. So for much of the power band, the distortion is below 0 0.01. And as you remember, it was down around 0 0.004 or something like that with 8 ohms, a little bit higher with 4, but still below 0.01%, which is excellent, really, for what it is. And you see the knee right here where we're getting into clipping. And we go above 0.1% with the 8 ohm load. This is logarithmic, and it kind of compresses towards the right. So this is going to be around... 18 watts and it goes above 0.1 with the 4 ohm load let's see 20 30 yeah we're probably around 31 watts or so again because it's logarithmic it's kind of spread out at the lower region so that's probably around 31 at 1 percent around 21 watts and closer to 37 watts or so at 4 ohms. So very good. Okay, so now with the LM1875, distortion is higher. It's very flat across the power band, but it's 0.1 instead of 0 0.01 that is below, which is okay. I mean, I like to see it be below 0.1, but you know, that's still an order of magnitude above what the TDA2050 was. And, of course, we have 
pretty sharp knees with the uh, clipping with the 1875. And we're going above 0.1% distortion at 8 ohms. Oh, I'm going to say that's probably around 15 or 16 watts. And with the forum load, it's only a little over 20, maybe 20 and a half. And as you remember, the TDA was up around 31 watts. So what's happening? I think it's the current limiting capability. They have current limiters, and the TDA is designed to handle more current than the LM1875 because the power at 8 ohms was similar, a little bit lower in the 1875, but the 4 ohm clipping area is uh, much more limited. I should mention these tests are done at a power supply voltage of plus and minus 20 volts. Now at the 1% level, 8 ohms, around 20 watts. I think the 2050 was 21 watts or so. And the 4 ohm is only 25, where it was 35 or 36 with the TDA chip. Okay, so now we're looking at distortion versus frequency. I ran these tests at 2 watts. So when using the 4 ohm, I had to drop the signal level by 3 dB to keep the power the same. So with the TDA 2050, it's more of the same goodness, really. Very low distortion across the frequency band. It starts to rise as we get into the higher frequency region. You know, around 2, 3, 4, 5. In this region, 5 to 7. With both loads, we go above 0.01. And I think this is a measuring anomaly. It kind of drops down. I, I played around with it. I couldn't get rid of it. I tried a higher sampling rate and all that stuff. But what I think happens, I think this should just continue straight on up to the 0.1 mark at 20 kilohertz. So a, a very good performance, again, from the TDA 2050. The LM1875 had a nice flat response across the frequency band, the distortion levels. However, it is, it, it is much higher. You can see it's below 0.1, where the TDA was mostly below 0.01. So yeah, not surprising, but it is an order of magnitude higher distortion. But again, it is flatter, especially at the uh, higher frequency area. It doesn't change as much. Again, I think there's a little anomaly with the little bumps I'm getting there. Finally, the uh, intermodulation distortion test. I ran the SMPTE type test. Uh, don't quote me on it. I think that stands for Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers or something like that. I don't know. I just, going by memory, correct me if I'm wrong. But it's a type of test that uses a uh, 60 hertz and 7 kilohertz signal at different levels. They're not equal levels, and it, the test measures the intermodulation distortion. Again, I, uh, I set the levels to be the same for 4 and 8 ohm loads. So with the 2050, you can see, of course, the uh, red line being 4 ohms is higher. And I ran a band from negative 23 dB input signal to negative 13. And I adjusted that so I can keep the power the same when using 8 ohm loads. That's why it shifted. That's why the 8 ohm is shifted over. But of course, the 4 ohm readings are higher. But you can see this. We're down in the negative 90 dB range with the 4 ohm load. And 8 ohms were around the negative 100 range, which is uh, very good. The LM1875, same deal here, but look how much higher it is. This is the negative 68 range, 4 ohms, and negative 74 with the 8 ohm load. Though they are flatter, you can see here, it doesn't change much as I swept the signal, which means higher power. So going back to what I said before, I, I did a 10 dB sweep with the signal, the input signal. So I would start at a low power and then end up at a high power, but not getting into clipping. So uh, 
yeah, the LM1875 has quite a bit higher level of intermodulation distortion, but it's certainly not bad. All right, let's summarize my findings, some of which were from the other video I shot a few years ago. And I also should mention that I used the parts that came with the kit. I didn't use my own parts I bought from Mauser or DigiKey. These came in the kit. I did test them with my little component tester to make sure the capacitance and ESR was good and the resistor values were correct and all that stuff. Everything checked out good, so I used it. So as we just saw, the distortion performance and power with the TDA-2050 was much better than the LM-1875. The 1875 is really not meant to be used with 4 ohm loads, though if you want to keep the voltage under 18 volts, plus minus 18 volt supply, that's fine. I'd even say the same with the TDA 2050, because at the higher voltages with the lower impedance, you're starting to push things. Now there's one way you can actually get more power from the LM 1875 using 8 ohm loads is well, it has a higher maximum supply voltage limit, 60 volts or plus minus 30 volts. Whereas the 2050 is only 50 volts or plus minus 25 volts. So you can run the LM1875 at plus minus 25 volts with an 8 ohm load and not bump into its current limiter and get around 30 watts or so. I didn't actually measure it. Maybe I did in the other video. I think the current limiter circuit is better in the LM1875. While it does limit to a lower level, preventing higher output with 4 ohm loads, it does work more gracefully with reactive loads. With the 2050, when pushing its power supply to higher levels with a 4 ohm load and a ported speaker, I could sometimes get it to make a popping sound. And that was on the kick drum beats. My speakers might have been dropping to 2 ohms and it was just kicking in the limiter. And the in current limiters, depending on how they're designed, they can make squeaks and pops and different noises when they activate with the reactive load. And I've used these chips in the past to power transformers to make like an inverter. And when I hit the current limit with the 2050, I could hear it squeaking, where the 1875 is more graceful and it doesn't do that. And finally, stability. I find the LM1875 to be a little more stable when doing my now standardized loading tests with the capacitance. The TDA2050 would oscillate. The LM1875 would ring, but not quite break out into an oscillation. I would recommend putting a coil on the output of both of them. I believe they call it a teal network. It's a coil in parallel with a 10 ohm resistor. And the chip should be fine with 0.7 microhenry. And you saw that when I set up my circuit here. I tested it. I had the, the coil installed here. Kind of what I expected already from the other video. But this is kind of more in-depth to see what's actually going on getting the curves with the Quantasylum. And, well, thanks for watching.